a summary, we're going to do a summary, uh, but before we do the summary, try to go over, just uh, touch on some key points uh, for maybe about 40, 45 minutes, and then we can end up, you know, maybe the last half an hour just in terms of some open discussion. Uh, basically, what I try to do is just kind of go back through the various handouts that we did and kind of just touch on some key ideas. Of course, no way we'll have possible to get any, any kind of depth. So we started off with the first session uh, coming out of the handout, Music as a Cause of Disease and a Healing Agent, which came out of psychosynthesis. We spent about three weeks on this piece. And some of the key ideas that it talked about were how uh, ancients understood the positive and negative effects of music on living organisms and incorporated this knowledge into the social and moral organization of their society. That the initiates who were the actual leaders of that society, the rulers, the healers, the priests, uh, the musicians, uh, actually defined and established the laws that govern and behavior that govern society in the context of the understanding of how these cosmic laws operate in terms of certain music can only be played at certain times, certain types of instruments were appropriate for certain occasions, uh, certain rhythms, certain songs that were then key that affected different parts of the body, uh, different attitudes of emotion, etc. But this was a conscious and understood uh, aspect of society. Uh, in traditional religious, uh, to traditional indigenous society, I'm talking about back in the clans, the more traditional uh, uh, culture that lived more, you say, like in the bush or at a more basic level, the non-classical civilization per se in terms of the big city-states, but the people who are still living in traditional societies closer to earth that musicians were regarded as healers and had to know the appropriate music for specific occasions, events, rituals, ceremonies, and healing. The Greek philosophers were taught and studied with the African masters of the East, particularly in Kemet and India. And this knowledge can be seen reflected through the teaching of Pythagoras, who used music, music to cure diseases of both body and mind, and also to restore the harmony of the soul's faculties. Plato accorded much importance to music as a powerful means of psychotherapy and education. In terms of modern times, music therapy is practiced only by a small number of modern healthcare professionals, uh, and both clinical and industrial research is revealing the healing effects of music. A lot of this is coming out of industrial research in terms of how music uh, affects workers and work conditions how different levels of music, different types of music actually can reduce stress, uh, which then can improve productivity, increase a more calming state, uh, that also then affects safety. Uh, it can re reduce the level of uh, accidents, like in a production um, environment. So uh, there's a lot of things dealing with um, uh, production lines and how you know, it gets monotonous. So the experiment in terms of different types of music impacted the awareness and consciousness of the workers that then reduced absenteeism, that reduced stress, that reduced the amount of tension that people took home with them, which then impacted their family relationships, uh, that then <coughs> impacted absenteeism. Uh, it actually impacts or has an effect on one's immune system, either lowering or decreasing one's immunity to various diseases. Uh, which then also impacts work, you know, so we're looking at it in terms of productivity and, and, and money, you know, because uh, a major issue in the uh, workforce is absenteeism and the impact it has on the bottom line and costs and those kind of things. Uh, but in them looking at it from that perspective, they start to then validate and verify that music does have a direct effect on both the physical and psychology of human beings. Then you have clinical research that's going on. A lot of that research is going on related to pain, and how music can help uh, lower or really increase one's tolerance to pain, or really take the mind off its direct uh, registering of pain, so it seems like one is not undergoing as much pain. A lot of this is going on in dentist offices in terms of now doing with music, headsets, and those kind of things. 
and they also did uh, research in terms of uh, people with seizures and showing how uh, certain music that is being listened to as one is on the onset of seizure can reduce the severity of seizures and that then those who then uh, uh, I want to say ritualize your life, but basically habitually listen to music and incorporate that into their life, actually then uh, prevent it uh, from uh, uh, seizures from actually then occurring. Um, what else? So then we went into identifying the five elements, the five principal elements of music, which was rhythm, tone, melody, harmony, and treble. And you can find this on page 239 in Psychosynthesis. Then it also we talked about the psychic structure of the human constitution, and then we went into the the uh, the psychosynthesis of dynamic, the egg. It talks about the lower unconscious, the middle unconscious, the higher unconscious or superconscious, the field of consciousness, the conscious self or I, the higher self, and the collective unconscious. And kind of talk about those different levels. Uh, from that, we then went into the negative effects of music and started talking about how music was utilized in terms of the film industry, the different types of music, and how it can affect uh, the consciousness, it can affect the emotions, it can affect the energetic body, uh, how different sounds uh, can actually stimulate memories. Uh, it can actually, um, also especially we talked talk about music in terms of the type of music we listen to on the radio and the type of music that's connected to the film industry and how music really impacts the subconscious mind or the unconscious mind and to the degree that a person is not conscious or aware of the effect of music, it has a greater impact on your unconscious mind. So even if you don't know what's going on, and you're sitting up there and you are allowing it to come in, it really has a greater impact on you than if you're conscious. Because if you're conscious, your conscious mind can regulate the impact of the impression that your mind is receiving. Uh, we also, we talked about the positive effects of music in terms of, uh, again, the opposite side, how it can affect, you know, your emotional level, your uh, mental level, your spiritual level. We talked about the process of synthesis, and they talked about three levels of synthesis. They talked about spiritual psychosynthesis, they talked about then where one unites the various component parts of themselves, Turn if you go back to the, you know, the lower unconscious, the middle unconscious, the higher self, the I, etc., how one needs to integrate those things together. <laughs> then we talked about inter-individual synthesis, how one then can integrate and be able to relate to in the other individuals from a higher perspective. And then we talked about cosmic psychosynthesis in terms of when one becoming in harmony with the divine order of the universe, the one then becomes united or synthesized with the universe. Then we outlined musical therapy in terms of uh, based upon physical and psychological principles. And there were basically about 10 different aspects of it. <laughs> One was that you need to have adequate information concerning the particular type of musical therapy you're engaging in. So then you need information and knowledge on what you're doing. You then need to relax. So to the degree that you were relaxed before you engage in a particular uh, musical therapy that had a great effect on you. You need to understand the right dosage in terms of how long because you can saturate yourself and then you can then reverse a positive to a negative by saturating yourself. Let's say any extreme is dangerous. And that's true for anything. You know, you, you can be a vegetarian, you can go to an extreme of vegetarianism and it becomes negative. You know, you can be too black where it becomes negative or you can be too white or whatever, you know. So any extreme is dangerous. So you have to understand the right amount of dosage, the right amount of time you need to then sit down and go through these things. And each individual will be different for each individual. So then you need to be aware of that. You know, what is your appropriate dose or something? And then I could also say that analogy can also be true for a lot of things. You know, some people can work longer at something than another person. Some people can read longer at a certain time. Some people can work out longer. So it's true for all things. What is the appropriate dosage for yourself? Then it talks about repetition in terms of how the more repetitive you deal with it, it becomes more ingrained and starts to have a greater impact. 
and we talked about how repetition of experience actually creates a neural path in the mind that the more times you repeat it, the more ingrained the neural path becomes and the easier it becomes to then recall or go into that condition of state. This is also true for meditation or anything. The more you practice it, you actually remember that every stimulation creates a neural response in the brain. And so through repetition with that, that neural path then becomes more and more ingrained, either positive or negative, that then makes it easier for uh, the response relative to that particular stimulation. So then you can then translate that into all kinds of experiences in terms of then what repetition does. So let's say take you to the whole thing about advertising and promotion. The whole issue is how many repetitions or how many contacts can you have with your market. The more contact with your message you have with your market, the more ingrained the message becomes in the mind, so the more response you get from your particular market segment. Which also then can be utilized in terms of education. You know, because the problem that we're having is a lot of the individuals that we are seeking to impact, we have very little contact with them. And so just because we have a, one thing where every year on Black History Month, we think, you know, wow. But in actuality, if you then measure that relative to all the other impressions that they're getting through the whole 365 days, you can then really see the level of impact that you're having. Because a greater number of repetition in its opposite can then outweigh the number you have in the positive. So if somebody can let you have a certain period of time of doing something with the awareness that I'm going to reverse it by then doubling up on the opposite repetition but then would neutralize whatever benefits it has. This is also true with you in your life. You know, it's almost like what people say, uh, they go and eat a bunch of food and say, I want a Diet Coke, right? In terms of, so because I'm taking a Diet Coke, I think I'm dieting. But then all the other, you look at the totality of what you're consuming, it's negative. But because consciously they focus on this one positive, they then try to rationalize that the whole thing is positive. Anyway. Volume or loudness, the volume or loudness of the music, something can be, it can either be too soft where it doesn't really impact the system or it can be too loud, but then a positive then becomes negative because of the dissonance created by the loudness of the sound. Then one should rest after the musical experience or the musical session so that that relaxation allows the system to really absorb it. Because it's just like when you wake up early in the morning and you jump right on up and try to get into your day, as you're coming out of that unconscious state and you, your unconscious mind may be communicating to you, you jump it up in such a hurry and changing the direction of your consciousness that the other information is lost. So then it needs to be better for you to wake up 15 minutes earlier than when you need to get up so that you can make a calm transition into your day. You will retain more of the experience from your unconscious mind that you were going through while you were sleeping. Uh, choice of musical pieces in terms of being aware that different musical pieces have different themes and that theme then is then uh, created through the combination of rhythm, tone, melody, harmony, and treble. And so then you need to be aware of what is the particular theme of the musical piece that you are picking as uh, this particular type of musical therapy. When I say musical therapy, it also can mean how you use music therapeutically. Not that you may be, well, I say we're all sick in some way, because if you grow up in the mo modern world in America and engage in the various ideas in the modern world, you're in some kind of dissonance, you know, with your true self. And so we all need some kind of therapy. Uh, then the next level is where the person actually starts to engage in musical performance themselves. That means that you have even a greater therapeutic experience when you actually play or participate in it actively as opposed to just passively. So it kind of magnifies the experience of the therapeutic activity. Because then if you look at traditional African society, it was always participatory. It wasn't where I just came up here and played to you as an audience. It was always call and response, and then the audience actually engaged via through song, clapping, dance, in the experience themselves, but then magnified the experience. And then that takes it to the next level, collective application. Remember we had talked about how when a collective group of people engage in common musical experiences, it creates a cohesion between the group because it actually creates a common uh, harmonic experience 
that then wins or unites that group in a more cohesive manner. Of course, that would be relative to you know, the intensity, the movement of selection, you know, all these things we talked about. If you can then create a formula where you can literally start to elevate the cohesive nature of a group of people, or in the opposite, you can create a dissident experience that creates a divisive factor in the group. And then you have two levels of collective application, either a receptive or passive, where one then just kind of collectively sits down together and experiences it, or active, where we actively participate in it together. And understand the active participation has a greater impact uh, on the uh, benefits, either positive or negative, of the musical experience. Then we went into uh, the next series was Music is Magic, of the Occult Power of Music, uh, by uh, Fabre. Uh, again, uh, Psychosynthesis was by uh, Azioli, in terms of his book. And in this one, he really got into the uh, talking about how the Egyptian initiates, oh, excuse me, this one was not by, uh, this was out of uh, Helen Kareem's book on uh, New Age Interpretation of the Bible, Volume 7. Uh, where she dealt with music, but she was really talking about the various parts of scripture that were really based upon uh, musical keynotes. She really focused in on the psalms and really talking about how originally the psalms were not to be spoken in this English language, but were actually to be sung or chanted in a musical format, and that a lot of the original scriptures, in terms of the original languages, was tonal or melodic languages and so the scriptures or the ideas were done in a musical format as opposed to this very kind of monotone way that English language, you know, although uh, going to the uh, Baptist church or whatever is not monotone, they actually modulate their voices with the scripture and actually get into a musical uh, composition, you know, in terms of even how the chorus comes in and accentuates things or the choir, the bands and all that. So they're really perpetuating or uh, actualizing the way the ancients have done it. And if you go to traditional, or like even the old Catholic churches, they did mass in Latin, you know, in the chant format as opposed to just talking rhetorically about the subject. Uh, again, the point was is that these things actually came out of uh, Kemet, and Kemet being the the culmination of the African experience. Uh, so you can always trace these things back to inner Africa. Uh, it also then talked about how this Egyptian uh, knowledge then was passed on to Greece and Palestine, which gave you your, the Greek, and the West, and also the Hebrew. Uh, and then we talked about the Hebrew experience and the whole thing about Moses coming out of Kemet and really starting that whole dispensation in the Aryan Age, uh, which we can then also talk about some other things. Then we talked about the Psalms, originally sacred songs, and they were intoned in particular keynotes and particular rhythms that affected the mind and the character of the worshiper. Remember we said how the particular ritual ceremony was then keyed to the particular note that related to the particular experience. And we'll get into on the next series, uh, our next part, talking about how each of the seven planets had a particular uh, tone, the ABC or note that was related to it. So then each of the days of the week had a particular tone, each of the months, each of the hours of the day. So then you could actually then create a musical composition that actually uh, took into consideration the, the synthesized keynote of all those particular elements and then intoned or created the melody and the songs to represent that more cosmic harmonics. Uh, then we got into talking about the ancient Egypt and the Hebrew recognized three principles in man, body, soul, and spirit. So then we passed out the handout on the sevenfold constitution of humans, and in that sevenfold constitution on the side, it then broke those sevenfold constitution into those three aspects of body, soul, and spirit. And we also brought in some astrological connections as a side note, a sidebar in terms of body related to your ascendant sign, soul related to the moon, and spirit related to the sun. 
Uh, then we got into talking about the etheric double and that how we have a physical nature and then we have an etheric nature or energetic nature and that the energetic and the physical are, are two parts of a whole. You can't separate the physical from the energetic. And once the energetic, once the physical can no longer hold the energetic, then that's how death occurs. And so from that we then talk about the whole nature of the soul and how the soul actually was the, the essence of a life experience, was captured in the etheric nature or the energetic nature of the human and the essence of that experience is what was being held with it in one thing they call the causal body, but we can call it the soul. And that energetic quality, which is the summation of all of one's life, which means the summation of the response to stimulation. This is the key. It is the response to the stimulation. So the experiences that we go through which determines the quality of your life is how you respond to that stimulation, not the stimulation itself. So that means that somebody can be born in the lap of wealth, which is a certain level of experiences, and somebody else could be born in the lap of poverty. And because of the way the individual responded to the poverty, their life would be a higher qualitative level than the person who was born in the wealth because of the way they responded to those experiences. Or it could be vice versa. And what I'm trying to impress on you is it's not the experiences, it's how you respond to the experiences that creates the quality of the experiences, and that's what your soul carries forward with you. Are the stimulations that come to you what you need to learn in your life lessons? I mean, are they coming to you because that's what you need to learn? The stimulations? Yeah, the actual things, the events or whatever. Um, it's on multiple is, levels. Is it like your soul knows what lesson you need to learn and that's what it calls for? Is that like the same? Well, yeah, thing? that's true. Okay. But then your consciousness is going to determine how you interpret it which goes back to the whole issue in terms of how aligned are you with your inner spiritual self. But yeah, the only reason you're here, I mean when you, when you, when your energy, when the energy incarnated and became an independent operating entity, when you were born and became an independent entity, that quality then set up the potentiality of this particular life. So then that quality then will generate certain responses and so then those responses then are actually ideally trying to again evolve evolve you you know in terms of lessons you need right mm -hmm. yes sir the the double and the astral body the astral body is really more the etheric body is really connected to the physical so it's just pure the pure physical nature the astral body is really more connected to the emotional nature. So then the etheric, the theory is like just pure energy. The astral is really supposed to be the dimension of, through which entity, once consciousness and feelings and those kind of things have become incorporated into the energy, then it's the astral plane is a dimension upon which they exist. And then the astral plane has, well, has a multiple levels or two major levels. It has a lower level and it has a higher level. The lower level is really where all those negative energies, entities or whatever exist or dwell within. And the higher level of it is really where the higher or more intuitive aspects or more creative aspects of those entities exist in. The only thing that separates them though is the vibratory rate of the quality of the energy. I mean, it's not like, so, so astral is more equated or related to feeling and emotional nature where etheric is more just pure energy now astral has to exist on energy so etheric permeates all of them but the change or the, the differentiation between the two is that the uh, astral is really connected more with emotions and feelings and those kind of things philosophy that kept talking about like going to the astral level to go to the etherical level, and the etherical level was higher. And in one 
school, like they said, the spherical layer, you know, between the physical and the natural one. And I was just, I couldn't tell what, what were they talking about. Please. Really, we, I mean, <laughs> remember we had talked about that in actuality, there is a, there is a reflection on the higher level and the lower level. So then you have pure physical, you have emotional, and you have lower mental. When you flip it over, you have higher mental, intuitive, and divine. And so then that means that you have a lower etheric and a higher etheric, a lower astral and a higher astral, and then a lower in the sense of the, of the physical, which is like the physical just is solid on its highest level, the opposite is pure spirit, which is solid in that it's undeviated, you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So, so again, you always got to go to the school and see the school's terminology, you know, because they come, you know, different guys come in, they, they perceive it in a different way. But essentially, you know, you can see the concept too, in terms of the reflections in the two, in the two different levels. And then, it's, then you have the bridge. So the mind is the bridge. Mind is the bridge. The really consciousness. Right, I see what you're saying. You have the consciousness, the self. Right. In between. That's and right. So it can choose which way. Right. That's right. And it chooses when it, it, it's, its direction chooses which way the energy is going to go. Uh, then we went into the sevenfold constitution in terms of the physical, the etheric, the astral, the lower mental, the bridge, then the higher mental, the intuitive, and the divine. Uh, then they talked about how we went into the story of King Saul and, and David and the seven strings on the lyre, and then we went and uh, uh, brought out a piece of, from spiritual astrology to really talk about how that's also an astrological, astronomical story but also how you saw uh, David is the soul and the seven string lyre or heart are the seven chakras. And then by playing those things harmonically, you then resolve or calm the king who's, in ag who's agitated, which is your higher mind. You cool your, your mind out and you harmonize yourself that you can rule appropriately. So it's an analogy. We went through that, pass it out. And then we also talked about how the, they talked about the different instruments were key to different parts of the body. That percussion instrument affected the desire body. That string instruments affected the etheric body. And that wing, wind instruments affected the mental body. Again, this is this particular uh, school, <coughs> Helen Kareem. Then we talk about how there were male and female <coughs> instruments, and that the male related to spirit, fire, gold, sun, and was active, and that the female related to matter, water, silver, moon, and was receptive, and how they actually put together uh, choruses that then took the masculine and the feminine and played them in various combinations to create various effects in the congregation, and that certain uh, ceremonies brought out the feminine energy, and that feminine was the more receptive and the inner, and then the more active or assertive side was the masculine side. And how they then use those different type, that theory or concept to then activate or stimulate, be it they're going to war, or they're going out to, to have a very high spiritual uh, meditative trance state, you would have a more receptive type music. Or you might have a very active type music to take you up to this high level of agitation and then bring in a receptive music to then reverse the reverse the energy to internal. Again, I'm just saying, they started to use these things to start to work the different bodies to get various responses. Then she also outlined four ethers. She said there was a lower or animal ether, which was the chemical and the light ether, and then there was a higher or spiritual, which was the light ether and the reflecting ether. So then, and then I also got into the etheric body, how the etheric body or etheric level had different levels to it. And then we talked about, the, we talked on the 666 and we brought out the uh, book on the um, uh, Apocalypse Unsealed. 
and talked about how the 666 or the mark of the beast actually talked about the lower mind and the book of Revelation talked about the seven seals which got us into the seven chakras. Uh, from that we then went into rhythm and the special correlation with the breath. I passed out the handout on the uh, nature of the breath and the uh, procession of equinoxes. We didn't really go over it extensively, but you were supposed to review it um, in terms of outside of class. So it talked about the uh, 72 degrees, how every, every 72 years uh, the procession moves one degree. And then it talked about how the normal or uh, number of breaths were 72. I believe it was 72 per minute. And how as we're moving into the Aquarian age, that the cycle is changing to 60 years for one degree. And that will have a correlation that the breath and the breathing will slow down to 60 breaths a minute. And they talked about how those animals in the animal kingdom that have the longest longevity, be it elephants, snakes, and turtles, or tortoises, have very slow breathing because breathing is directly related to heart rate. Heart rate is circulation of the blood and then how agitated or relaxed one is and how the more uh, restless animals have very rapid respiratory systems so that their mental capacities are more agitated. And so it correlated how as we move into this new cosmic environment of the Aquarian age, you will see the breathing pattern slow down more and more, which will then also facilitate higher levels of spiritual understanding and spiritual connection. Uh, then we went into the seven chakras. And it talked about how music works on the latent centers of the, of the aura, which relates to the seven chakras. We talked about the aura and how the aura was a culmination of all these different energy systems in the body. And collectively, they create your aura and that they were interpenetrating, that all these various levels interpenetrate. And the only thing that keeps them separated is the difference in frequency of vibratory rate. And then we talked about, uh, went over, uh, we had the handout that kind of did a little uh, package on the chakras. And we talked about the location of the chakras. We had the one at the base of the spine, which was the uh, sacral. The next one was the uh, solar plexus. Then we went to the spleen or hypergastric, the heart or cardiac, the throat or the, uh, what's that, the farginal the brow or the cavernous and the crown or the top of the head in terms of the seven chakras. We talk about how each of these chakras are related to a group of nerves that kind of bunch together or cross at that center which creates a higher uh, electromagnetic center that then creates a doorway for the uh, in, I want to say inhalation, or the ingestion of uh, energy fields that then also stimulate those various organs, those various nerves, and that relates to a certain level of consciousness. We also talked about briefly how each of the chakras vibrate a certain frequency that then we, they visualize as a flower with so many petals, with so many numbers of petals, and when you add up all the numbers to all the chakras, it equals 144. And then the crown chakra was 1,000, so then that became 144,000 which then was the metaphysical understanding of the so-called 144,000 that will be saved. And basically the salvation comes in in terms of opening up your chakras or your levels of consciousness to where they vibrate at their full capacity. So then you then become saved because now you're vibrating at the frequency of 144,000. And when you add up 144, it equals a nine. So then we go back to the grand enad, which then takes us back into the mental ideology and the whole uh, foundation for the creation. Right. Uh, boom, we talked about, then we gave different correlations in terms of how each of the chakras can relate to the endocrine glands, the, the adrenals, the gonads, the pancreas, the thymus, the thyroid, the pituitary, and the pineal. They also relate to color. Uh, they have different images that relate to them. 
we talk about how you have incoming primary energy that then hits the chakras, that then goes out to outgoing secondary energies, and then you have the nerves, the nervous system, the endocrine glands, and then it affects the blood. And so the blood is the life. So then it starts to show us how these various biblical connotations are actually physiological, and then at the physiological is also functioning from cosmic principles. Uh, then we also talked about um, different diseases as related to the different glands, uh, different animals, different systems that are related to them, etc. So you have that whole handout. We talked about the spinal column and how the different sections of the spinal column are related to different signs of the zodiac. So different signs of the zodiac have different keynotes. These are signs of the zodiac that have the equivalent color and a planet which has a keynote. So then also, how many vertebrae do we have in the, in the spinal column? How many? It's 33. How many degrees are there in masonry? 33. So then going up the various degrees of masonry actually then is just a repetition of going up the spinal column or raising up the energy that is latent at the lower chakra, which then goes into the analogy of Hiram Abiff, who is the killed or the uh, murdered master. Well, what is the master? The soul is the master. And who, how did he get murdered? He got murdered by uh, a, a perverted thought, uh, a deviant behavior, and um, uh, emotions. Physical, emotional, and mental. The negative aspect of the physical, emotional, and mental nature is what murdered the master, which is the soul. And the way he was resurrected was through initiation, through the various degrees of masonry, which goes back into then raising one's energy up to the different levels of consciousness. Okay. Uh, then we also had uh, music and planetary note and frequencies. We actually gave the different frequencies for the different notes and the different astrological signs and planets that they're related to. Now each note had a high, medium, and low sound which is inter interesting because when you go into traditional music, traditional music is based upon high, medium, and low sounds. Uh, and then those various combinations make up all the different rhythms. And each rhythm has a particular story, a particular occasion, that has a particular effect on the consciousness of the participants. Uh, again, then we went into uh, the various rhythms, because music is rhythm, and we talked about the various rhythmic systems in the body, from the cerebral neurons to the cerebral rhythms to the beta rhythms, the alpha rhythms, the theta rhythms, the delta rhythms, heart rhythms, the respiratory cycle, the kidney cycle, the stomach and intestine cycle, the mu mu muscle cycle, the ovary cycle, the red blood cell cycle, the bone calcium cycle. Now each of them had different days or different amount of time from a hundred uh, from a thousand uh, cycles per second in terms of cerebral neuron cycle all the way to the bone calcium cycle being 200 days. The red blood cell cycle 128 days. The menstrual cycle is 28 days. The muscle cycle is 12 days. The stomach and intestines is three cycles per minute for the stomach and one cycle per minute for the intestine. The kidneys is a 24 hour cycle. The respiratory cycle is 22 cycles a minute the heartbeat was 76 or 72, but then there's a different chambers because the first chamber is 76 beats a minute and the second chamber is 40 to 50 beats a minute. Then the delta cycle was one to three cycles a second, the theta was four to seven cycles, the alpha was eight to 13 cycles a second, the beta was 18 to 22 cycles, and the slower cerebral cycle was 50 cycles per second. And then the, so it's just how all of these various cycles of frequencies actually then culminate in terms of the aura or the energy field of the human being. Then you got the various the neurons that's going in, in the cycles, you got the various blood, you know, etc. So we talked about that. Uh, sevenfold constitution and etc. So from there we then went into the etymology of the word music and number considered as musical principle. Then we went into, the, uh, that was the title of the book by uh, Fabre. 
And he then reinforced that music came from out of, or the, the metaphysics came out of the temple and the initiates of Kemet, and that the Greeks uh, then got, took that legacy because they were educated in the East, and that the word music was really based upon the Greek word of muse, which was Egyptian for mas, M-A-S, or M-O-U-S, which probably if you take out the vowel, it would just be M-S. And it signifies that music signifies generation, production, or development outside a principle. It also represents to formal manifestation or the passive passage to <coughs> act of that which was in potency. So going from potential to actual. Right. But also then the whole issue of music relating to in the beginning was the word or actuality in the beginning was the frequency of the vibration. And vibration actually is, is movement and when you have movement you have electron flow. And to create electron flow you have to have a difference in potential which goes back to the opposition. Because if each thing was equal, you would have no difference in potential, you would have no electron flow. With no electron flow, you would have no creation. So creation then was the potentiality that resided in the noon, meant by theology, which was in a pre-created state. Because you had four pairs of unters or principles that existed in the noon that then that potential then set up its opposite which is the actualization of that potential which then was Pata moving out of the noon and simultaneously residing for Atum. Atum then reflected the potential by then perceiving the potential in itself and naming itself and the name is a frequency or a vibration. And original words were melodic and not like we speak today. So original language was melodic or music. And then we had the first meditation was on the twa. And listening to how they communicate and how they make music. And it was not even words. It was just sounds. Almost like a yodel type sound which was the first foundations for language. Because if you listen to your environment, you will not hear words, you will hear sounds. And so in original humans, they then started to mimic sound. And then later those sounds translated into syllables that then evolved into words or language. So then uh, we talked about, the Egyptians talked about the three muses. They, they had only three muses, where the Greeks expanded them to nine. But the three muses for the Kemetics were uh, Melet, M-E-L-E, M-E-L-E-T-E, -E, which is she who produces or generates. Then it was, uh, well, I guess M N E M E meaning she who conserves or designates, and then the third was I O D A O E D E, she who idealizes or renders comprehensible, remembering that so-called deities are really cosmic principles and that all of your kinetic theologies were based upon trinities or triads. So then you go back to the original trinity in terms of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So then we went in terms of talking about what did that mean cosmically where well, you got the dialectical process of action, reaction, and synthesis which was 
uh, cardinal fixed immutable, which is uh, one of the foundations for astrology. And you can get an astrological outline of how you had cardinal fixed immutable combined with the three, combined with the four, fire, earth, air, and water, which gave you the 12 combinations of life, which is really what astrology is based upon. The animals and symbolism of astrology came after the principle. They did not define the principle. The, the ancients understood the principle and then they looked in nature to the symbolism that characterizes the principle and then gave it that name. But at the same time, if you look at the particular time of the season that the sign is operative, that means that that cosmic energy will be reflected in nature. And you will see that same operation. But then, it was interesting, so then you say cardinal. She who produces or generates. Fixed. She who conserves or designates. Mutable. She who idealizes or renders comprehensible. So for you to walk, you got to initiate the, the walk. But then you got to have some response to it. You got to have there got to be some resistance to it, or you won't create any balance. And it's based upon that action and reaction, then you have the phenomena of walking. It becomes comprehensible. So I'm just trying to show how all of these fundamental ideas upon which all the other systems are based come out of these primary <coughs> concepts of principles that were already resident in African civilization probably over 10,000, somehow even 50,000 years ago. Because if we go back to the Twi, you will see the same concept because the original idea for deity was three cross sticks. Two sticks this way with one in the middle. That was because they had no word for the great creative power. It was a symbol. And because the way we experience creation is through the Trinity. Those three factors or three modes. All right. All right. So then uh, he started to break down how sacred music is based upon number and started to talk about the three and the four because actually the three is related to the fifths of the musical scale because the string or the instrument is broken down into thirds. If you take a piece of string and you divide it into thirds, you would generate the, the fifth, the scale of the fifth. And the four is related to the uh, quarter notes because it's breaking things into halves, which is actually quartering or quarters or fourths. So the three and the four, which relate to the fifth, the, 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 uh, the fifths and the fourths, also then generate three times four is twelve. And then they are, and then three plus four is seven. And you have seven major notes in a scale with their 12 major and minor, which sharp and flat. So they start demonstrating how music is really based upon number and numerical principle, and how the universe itself is based upon numerical foundation, which is also geometry. So from there, it talks about how the ancients then codified music and equated it that each of the signs of the zodiac had a particular note. Each of the seven days of the week related to one of the seven primary planets. Now each of the hours of the day was related to a particular note. And so for every 24 hours you got a flip. 12 times 12 gives you both halves, night and day. It gives you a whole. So then it says each plan has a note, each day has a key note, each hour has a key note, each month has a key note, each year has a key note. Every person, place, or thing has a key note that vibrates and sympathetic resonance with its basic nature. So then by understanding the keynote or the frequency or the vibration of the thing, which they use the thing, understanding its name. To understand the name of a thing does not live with its name, but its energy or its vibration. Because that is what you can then understand the essence of a thing. The name is really supposed to represent a thing's essence. Which also lets you know what's the base of your name. Because every name has a frequency and it represents something in the universe. So what do your name really represent? Because every time someone calls that name, 
it is a frequency that then is actualizing or stimulating something. What is it stimulating? That's why language is so important. African people will never be totally who we are until we regain the articulation of our traditional language. Because the culture and language is the history and culture of that particular group. And this language that we're speaking, although we can use to communicate with, will never take us back to our origin. It will always be something off in terms of because it doesn't resonate to our historical reality. It's also important about your name. So each day of the week is assigned to one of the known seven planets. So Sunday is Sunday. Monday is Moon Day. Tuesday is Mars Day. Wednesday is Mercury Day. Thursday is Jupiter's Day. Friday is Venus Day. And Saturday is Saturn's Day. So that means each day has a keynote that's related to the vibration and the energy of that particular planetary body. Then it starts talking about how the seven major nodes on the diatonic scale, uh, they mediate or they come to a unity between the fourth and the fifth. Uh, in terms of, and that creates a, a harmonic pattern which we go into the next. Then we talked about how music, the principle of harmony of cosmic law, we went to sacred science. This is around page 184. We talked about harmony is number and harmony is geometry. We talked about how the golden mean or the golden section uh, actually was the perfect proportion upon which all life is based. And also that proportion was the, uh, the mediation or the balance between the arithmetic and the uh, harmonic, I believe it's really the harmonic proportion gives you the perfect symmetric pattern. It's been took us into uh, sacred geometry where it talks about mediation and geometry becomes music. Now geometry is frozen music. And you start off talking about particular knowledge and essential knowledge. Now particular knowledge and relative knowledge really is based upon the observed outer things and how essential knowledge is the essence of that thing, which is the inner workings of it that reflects itself in this outer experience. And how we, and we talk about how we mostly deal with uh, particular knowledge. We're looking at a particular thing, we're trying to be, uh, gain understanding from the particular thing, but we don't understand the essence of the thing. Like we look at particular laws as opposed to understanding the essence of the law. We look at particular programs as opposed to the essence of the program, and the particular behavior as opposed to the essence of the behavior. And it says the law that governs the creation of things are the same laws as those which allow for their comprehension. The laws which govern the creation of things are the same laws as those which allow for their comprehension. And essential knowledge is an understanding of these laws. So it just goes back to the whole topic of initiation and understanding the seven liberal arts and sciences from a metaphysical perspective because they define the laws that govern creation of the universe. And if you don't understand the laws that govern creation, you can't comprehend creation. And the real purpose of religion is to bind one back to the origin of things. And the origin of things is the first principle that generates everything. As opposed to we in the contemporary religion, they bind you back to the particular time that that particular religion came about. It gets into what? Particular knowledge. They don't deal with the essential basis of the religion, which is universal. Which then will give you essential knowledge. And that's why people are in conflict now, because they're still dealing with particulars. You look at every every day, everybody talking about the particular as opposed to the essence of the thing. So harmony can only come to understand the essence of the thing as opposed to the particular of the thing. But then we went into the mediating principle, which I will go over. 
which uh, was in sacred geometry. And the mediating, it talked about a mediating proportion can be defined as a group of three unequal numbers such that two of their differences are to each other in the same relationship as one of these numbers is to itself or to one of the other two numbers. So we talked about how, and this is a, when we talked about the different proportions, we had the four-factor proportion and the three-factor proportion. It says, so we're talking about mediation or medium. which is the cornerstone of ancient philosophical mathematics. And the medium is the, you know, the midpoint where, where things meet up at. You know, where is that point of balance where everything meets at? In every situation, there is a medium point somewhere. The whole thing is, can you find out where that point is? It's almost like when you practice in Aikido, in Judo. When you can find that medium point, you can reverse the situation. With very little effort, with very little effort if you find that point. And everything has that point. I talked about the three major meters were the arithmetic, the geometric, and the harmonic. And I won't go into all the details. We need to get the handout uh, and talk about it or, or review it. But it did talk about the most important and mysterious character of the harmonic proportion is the fact that the inverse of every harmonic progression is a arithmetic progression. So that means that if a harmonic progression is ascending, the opposite, which is descending, is an arithmetic proportion. And then the, when you put both of an ascending and a descending, or a harmonic and a arithmetic progression together, the median point would be geometric. Harmony. Where they need that create that geometrical harmony or harmony that's there, which is the perfect proportion. Again, I can get some technical, but it says how, in other words, the arithmetic and harmonic means become the double geometric ratio, or between the double geometric ratios or the numerical ratios which correspond to the tonal interval of the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth. So the arithmetic progression and the harmonic progression, when you put them together over each other, where they start to match, creates the intervals for the fifth and the intervals for the fourth, which are two uh, scales that give you the basic musical scale. So basically music is the mediation between harmonic proportion and arithmetic proportion, which is the geometric. The mean between the mean, the mean point. So where they mean that in terms of the mean. And it gets more, it gets into the technical stuff about it. In one sense it is, in one sense it is, in what sense do you think it would be? It's like two, and it's versus one half. So two plus a half is two and a half. And then divide that and that's the mean. And that's the important. That's the Yeah, that's for that. Mathematically, what he's talking about in terms of astrologically, the relationship in terms of applying it to an opposition which is two planets that are opposed to each other. So now, based upon what we were talking about, mediation would become the clue to resolving that. Which is what? No, but if you have an opposition, which is two planets opposing one another, what 
What were we talking about? What were we, we talking about? We were all right. No, the balance. Now, well, how does that translate to relative to the opposition? It's really simple. Now, to make it business, but it's clear. Because you have a chart, and you got the chart, and you got, say, say you got Mars is opposed to Saturn. That's an opposition. The opposition is an opposition. The way you look to reconcile the opposition is the midpoint. And so then you would look at what signs or what points go to the midpoint. And if you have something at that midpoint, that's the that means the thing of how you do the method to resolve these two things. Or when something transits that midpoint, it also would create a critical time in the to resolve that opposition in the life. Again, what hope you can start seeing is you start understanding the basic principles when you confront the situation it gives you a foundation on how to resolve it. It also will show you that an astrological illumination is based upon this cosmic information knowledge. It's not just arbitrary that somebody says and follows and stuff, it's based upon principles. It's actually reflecting Geometry and all you know, number, geometry and harmonics, and it's also astronomy with astrology. So you got the four primary uh, um, arts and sciences that are operating. Anyway, then it talks about how the golden proportion is the archetype for this form of development, form of frequency, and form of growth. That the, that the golden proportion is the ratio that represents musical progression and musical harmony, but it's the same proportion that represents all forms of growth, that the body grows in proportion to the golden mean, right? That plants grow to, in that proportion, that animals grow in that proportion, that shells grow, uh, vegetables, fruit grow in the same progression. I mean, that as they develop, they develop in uh, series. The things don't grow at the same time. You know, things have spurts, and they spurt, 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 spurt. So those growth spurts or growth phases grow in proportion on the same ratio of the growth section. The way your body is divided up is the same proportion. So anyway, we talked about that. Uh, then we went into talking about melanin and the organizing principle of life. And I kind of kind of round this out. And so when we talked about melanin, we went into an article that was uh, melanin, the organizing molecule by uh, Barr and uh, I'll just kind of review the key characteristics of melanin. which were the established properties were the most primitive, melanin was the most primitive and universal pigment in living organisms, present at the inception of life, and having a potentially ubiquitous, that means everywhere, distribution across the plant and animal kingdom. So now you see melanin then creating the bridge between the plant and animal kingdom. And it also creates the bridge between the animal and the human kingdom because melanin, we'll go to other properties to see how, is a heterogeneous polymer with multiple constituents and types of bonds. Neural melanin, melanin of the neural system, increases with phylogenetic ascent. That means it gets more complex as it goes higher up the, uh, the, uh, evolutionary scale, reaching a peak in humans. It's extreme, extreme in vitro uh, and in vivo, means inside the body and outside the body. It has extreme stability and highly resistant to experimental analysis. Which means when they try to analyze melanin, it was so stable, they can't break it down. 
So they can't figure out how what makes it work because it's so stable they can't break it down. So they have to do a lot of speculation, although they're trying to create more mechanisms to do that. It says it functions as a remarkable uh, patient exchange polymer. It has the capacity to absorb energy and then to redistribute the energy to change the molecular structure of various molecules in conformity to keeping the body in harmony. So I mean, it functions as uh, it exhibits extraordinary binding of arom aromatic and lipid soluble compounds. It possesses except, except, exceptional oxidation reduction properties. It scavenges, releases, converts, and produces free radicals and maintains a stable free radical signal. Has semiconductive properties of physiological response to photic, acoustic, and electrical stimulation. That means it absorbs sound, it absorbs light, and it absorbs electrical impulses, which is really all that electrical impulses. But it also means that people are very sensitive to electrical stimulation. And then you're talking about how we're moving to this highly electronic environment. When well, you're basically talking about having wires running under the streets, through the house, through your car, you know, you carrying around beepers, cell phones, you know, we really still don't know what type of molecular response is going on from all the electrical stimulation. There is a response going on. And so that's, that would be to me, and there's somewhere, I know they're doing research in somewhere. You know, probably a lot of it's kind of negative, but it's been about. It's a greater problem with Caucasian people than with African people. And then if you look at the whole issue of melanin, its capacity to absorb radiation and to redistribute it in a more harmonious way, then those with less melanin, especially internal melanin, will have a greater negative stimulation by the sport and electrical field and other kinds of radiation also. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, melanin synthesizes in leukocytes and mast cells and trans and transport throughout the body in hormone-like fashion. It's proposed property. It's a amorphous semiconductor and they regulate neural firing. I mean, it can go through membranes. It's amorphous. It can go through membranes and they regulate the neural firing, the firing of your neurons to regulate the firing of your neurons. So when you're talking about how you respond to stimulation, it may function as an organic superconductor at room temperature. So it can absorb all these high levels of energy and maintain a calm or cool state. <coughs> as a melanocyte may store and release energy in a manner similar to a mitochondria. And the mitochondria are the energy producers inside the cell. They actually are the energy producers, they are like a little sun inside the cell that produces the energy to manufacture all the components to create the life of the cell. May direct embryological tissue differentiation as well as tissue regeneration. That means that we have the capacity to regenerate tissue. What I say? We have the capacity to regenerate tissue. <laughs> you get cut your head, you get your arm cut off, you have the capacity to regenerate it. The capacity to latent in the human organism is just for whatever reason, we ha have not been able to allow that particular potential to operate. Because in more uh, reptiles, they can regenerate parts of the body. And so every element of the evolutionary scale is still resident in the human, because the human evolved through all those 
level. But, and I don't want to get on speculation on why we can or whatever, but all of us raise consciousness and how our consciousness can either allow or disallow the full release of energies. Like in, in religion, they say if you truly believe, you can make miracles happen. Because the doubt creates resistance to electrical impulses, which then doesn't allow the full flow of the electromagnetism or the current. So then once you open up your mind and develop a high certain level of knowledge and self-confidence, you generate a whole other level of electrical energy and it just energizes you and it propels you to higher levels of consciousness. Uh, it says may direct homostatic regulation of neuroendocrine functioning. This is melanin can direct homostatic regulation of neuroendocrine functioning, immune response, tissue repair and regeneration, and the autonomic nervous system. They play both a cytoprotective and cytotoxic role through its photon, phonon, photon, light, phonon, sound, and free radical properties, and a strong bond the binding of lipid soluble molecules. They have the capacity to bind molecules. So then in a sense, melanin can register stimulation. It registers stimulation in relationship to keeping the system in harmony or balance. And then based upon how out of balance it is, then releases the proper energy or, or ion formation or radicals or whatever to alter the atomic structure of the atom to then create different molecule binding that then translates into either different hormone releases, different cells generation or whatever. Organ development, but everything based on the atoms, molecules, and everything is out of that. Uh, may regulate enzyme and membrane activity by control of metal ions functioning as cofactors or activators. Whereas now we're over at Eisenhower today. I met this system to the Cranston Center years ago. And so she was a biology, biochemistry major. So she was about, she wrote this paper talking about how uh, grass is the foundation of blood. That the chlorophyll, molecular structure of grass and chlorophyll is equivalent to the molecular structure of blood. The only difference is, is that in the grass, I think it's magnesium is a dominant model, I guess, atom, and then blood is iron. Now, grass, chlorophyll, is photosynthetic process. But then I was asking, well, what about melanin? Because melanin deals with the uh, simulation photograph for a photosynthetic process, which also translated into <coughs> energy regulation in the human system, and eventually into consciousness, right? But the point was, it's interesting that we had, as a matter of fact, Saturday's was in the paper she had wrote on this. Uh, so it's, it's just interesting in terms of just talking about, um, I talk about, may regulate enzyme and membrane activity via its control of metal ions. And that trigger was just, well, we move from chlorophyll, magnesium, to uh, metal or ferrium phosphate or the metal ion that then translated chlorophyll or the function of a chlorophyll system into the function of a blood system. Now all the other stuff in there, whatever, whatever, you can get into, but you just start seeing, when you start putting all this stuff together, you can just start seeing how the cell phone constitution of the human, the whole issue of moving from light to, to particle to atom, the molecule, and the molecule, the vegetable, animal, the human, and then consciousness. The human, basically the animal, the consciousness. And then how we talk about, when I talk about Arthur Young's piece in terms of the reflective universe, how we outline this process, which is a seven-fold process, and it's the process for all creation. He actually had, it was interesting because when he was doing, he was the first to develop the first functional helicopter. 
and he then reflected on the process he went through from conception to prototype the functional operative model and then he went into the research and mathematics and all that and then he founded this institute for the study of higher consciousness and was looking at the equivalent process in creation and metaphysics and he did this book that's kind of showed the correlation came up with this, this concept but if you look at the concept and look at theocracy and the sevenfold concept it ain't never the same thing so he probably was reading that stuff and said oh wow this match and he puts his own twist to it in a more contemporary format <clears throat> but it's just interesting how all this stuff just starts to fall into place and uh, which then helps to validate and verify the information and knowledge which can give you then confidence in what you know which then will accelerate your understanding. And really once you become confident in what, that you know what you know it then accelerates your capacity to know. Because you can then base your new knowing off the baseline of what you know you know and then it can give you validation and surety on which way to go as you in, in, interact with the new knowledge. But if what you know is just always just given to you and you never personally validate through experience and other tangible connections, then it's hard for you to then move off from the new knowledge because it just becomes speculation. It can even create confusion because it's like you can't pick it up. But anyway, and finally it says, melanin may regulate the various vitamins and cofactors involved in metabolism. So that kind of brought us, to me, all the way back around to the moon. The melanin black carbon base, which is the central building block in the universe, which is black carbon base. It's highly stable and can be analyzed, difficult for it to be analyzed or to be phantom and noon is the same thing and that everything existed there but it was imperceptible you couldn't perceive it but it existed and the only way you could perceive it was in the behaviors of things that came out of it but you still couldn't understand it so uh, in finality, again, this was a, 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 a overview. The, the goal was to introduce you to the material, to the book, uh, to some of the concepts, uh, so that if you were so moved, you would then have uh, the, at least the awareness of where you can go to get further information and knowledge. At the same time, it was building on us coming out of astronomy, astrology, number, geometry, and then now in the music. Uh, now this will lead us into the final three of the liberal arts and sciences, which will be rhetoric. So now we come out of music, understanding vibration and sound, then we're gonna go into rhetoric, which deals with language and the spoken word. Which also gonna take us into mantra and how they then intonate these various sounds and how it can resonate and then take you to all the states of consciousness. And once we move to rhetoric, we're then going to go into grammar, which then goes into symbolism, which then will take us back into the netters or the unters or the primary symbolism, which became the foundation for all creation stories, nature, etc. And we'll be able to then understand better language because language is based upon symbols and symbols were based upon man's early experience and interaction with nature and the environment, both cosmically and terrestrially. And then that'll then finish, we'll finish up with uh, the, a logic or dialectics, uh, as I said before. Once we get to logic, you will really understand how your reference point or the basis for your reasoning will become, have shifted from when we started. So things will become logical to you on a different level. The way you see things, your logic, hopefully, will change because your reference point, hopefully, will alter 
the cosmic repertoire. Then that becomes the basis of you then moving to the greater mysteries. Once you really internalize and understand the liberal arts and sciences and also the virtues. Because once you start looking at the universe in different ways, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to see things. And then you allow you to follow those things and go deeper and deeper into those things. And you'll have guidelines to help you navigate through the various things you encounter, the various obstacles and things you encounter. <clears throat> but the key of all of it is, is ideally if you're practicing the virtues, it deals with purpose and preparation for initiation and steadfastness and justice and obedience to the call. I mean, are you following your inner voice? Because it's always calling you. So are you obedient to the call? Are you steadfast in your obedience to the call? Do you, are you operating in a wise manner, controlling your thoughts and your actions? Are you operating in a just manner? In terms of understanding the difference between right and wrong? Do you have discrimination? Understand the real from the unreal? Do you have fortitude? Patience? So it's, it's those things that really provide the, the uh, infrastructure for you to then, as you gain this new perspective and become more energized, it allows you to maintain a harmonic balance. Otherwise, if you haven't dealt with those virtues, you go off on all kinds of ego trips and tangents and all kinds of things. But again, those two keys, the virtues, the heart, the, the, uh, the rock of sciences, the mind, can provide you with the tools for then to go into the solar mysteries, which is an individual journey. No one can go with you into that. And actually, you go into deeper states of your own consciousness. Because if you really are a reflection of the universe, while you're going deeper into your own state of consciousness, you go deeper into the universe. And if you truly know yourself, you will know how the universe is. So, feedback, comments. <coughs> Church was good. 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 I think you might be able to make that available, you know, some of the handouts and materials that you have to matter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Secondly, there's something I came across um, a couple of weeks ago and I thought you might want to know about it. Sort of the 